so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today we have uh, PTP, and the title of our talk today is Leveraging AI and Life Sciences, the Rational AI Architect Approach. So the agenda, as always, is rules of engagement. We'll just give a, a quick uh, perspective on things that we're probably going to use during the rest of the panel discussion. Uh, we'll have some introductions, and then we'll get right into the panel discussion. The goal also is if you're out in the audience and you've had similar experiences or questions, um, uh, you can react to what's being said. You can raise your hand. You can ask a question in the chat or the uh, uh, Q&A box, however you feel comfortable um, getting involved. I just want to remind you all as well that this will be recorded. Um, so if you have to leave early and you do have a question and you get it in there, you'll get to see uh, an answer to your question, et cetera. Uh, we'll try to get to everybody's questions um, throughout this hour. We did write a industry perspective on scientific data management. Um, so if you're interested in reading that, uh, it is the crux of some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, you can scan this QR code and download the uh, the uh, industry perspective slash white paper. All right. So scientific data management um, is really at the core of what a lot of us do uh, to ensure ultimate model quality data. And like all data, scientific data has a life cycle. Uh, and there are things you need to do uh, in order to provide or produce fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. That reusable part is where we really get into machine learning, artificial intelligence, generative AI, large language models, and you go down the line, which as everyone, and if not everyone knows, over the past couple of years have really evolved and their evolution timeframes are becoming almost instantaneous, not 12 months from now or anything like that. But in order to get there, and, and we're finding a lot of problems with large language models and things like that in science because of the detail that's needed. So in order to get there, we have to have the right culture first. You have to put the right strategy in place. Um, then you uh, can acquire or capture your data in the correct manner with the right contextualization, um, right metadata. Uh, then you can provide the information, the analysis, and the collaboration around that. That occurs today in drug discovery, for example, uh, gene therapy, cell therapy discovery. Um, you can manage, curate, version, which is critical, and archive data. Um, you can share and disseminate and, and ultimately publish and re reuse. And this is the crux of artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera. Getting secondary, tertiary value out of that data. And just to emphasize, we're in an infancy in scientific informatics. We're going to get to the point where we have all types of metadata on confidence, use in models, how it's been used in other uh, environments. Um, is it a workhorse? Is it a one-off? All types of things when it comes to data so that people have confidence when they get results, when they use models, et cetera. Because today, people are going to be skeptical. skeptical. And if you're uh, a uh, very skilled, highly knowledgeable science in a particular domain, and you know that data and those insights and outcomes better than anyone in the world, and you start to use these models and they're hallucinating, you're going to get upset and you're going to be, you're going to, you're not going to want to use this stuff. So finding how to use these models in today's world as things evolve is critical because they will give you uh, massive efficiency gains. All right, so today 
uh, we're going to have Aaron Jeske and Scott Sherry um, as the panelists on our conversation today around the rational AI architect. And uh, Aaron is a cloud architect at PTP. He's been building and running workloads in AWS since the initial days of S3. Uh, with leadership roles at Hasbro and Brightcove, Aaron leads PTP's cloud consulting practice, offering insight into architectural designs to achieve the business result PTP's clients expect. Aaron is on AWS Solutions Architect Professional, but that is just part of the story with his vast experience. And Scott, I'm gonna ask you to give a brief introduction of yourself as well. Hi everyone, and uh, thanks, John. Uh, I'm Scott, I'm Scientific Partner Advisor with PTP. My background is biochemistry. Previously, I was helping uh, companies who were using multi-omic data for use in visualizations and AI and machine learning models. And now I focus on the scientific partnerships at PTP with other life science clients. So um, a lot of things we're going to talk about today, data orchestration and management, uh, data acquisition, how are you going to move that data in the right format or with the right ontologies to use in your model. So I help support that. Thank you. Awesome. All right, cool. So let's get into it. Um, and again, I remind everybody, if you have questions, just put them in the chat or the uh um, Q and A box, and we'll try to intercalate that into what we're doing to you today. So, kind of the first question is: There's a lot of talk about cultural practices in successful organizations. Um, what does this mean to the rational AI architect, and and how you approach things, or even how you prepare to work with a client, etc. So. Uh I believe um, where we're heading with this is you're really asking who is initiating the requirement of your AI ML practice to be developed yeah. inside the organization. Great. Yeah. So uh, we see it come through a few different vectors, um, obviously with the hype cycle and NVIDIA's stock going up into the right and everybody looking, you know, talking about their partnerships of how they're either developing software or hardware or, or an amalgamation of those two to deliver new products. Uh, it comes in through a few different ways. Um, obviously, the your your C suite, your board, your board is looking to different differentiate your organization from your competitors. So that's a strong, uh, uh, this is what we see quite often uh, where things are coming from. However, now that things are starting to get some traction, and you know, if you look at Rosetta Fold versus Alpha Fold, just in the last few weeks, um, the the uh, the releases that have been happening around Rosetta Fold, there are a lot of people out there starting to come up with the competitive products that you would have you know, were, had no competition a year ago or two years ago or no real competition. Um, so you're starting to find just the, the implementers are now showing up at new companies and saying, I saw this work someplace else. You know, we're, we've been in this AI revolution for the last you know, year and a half with ChatGPT, but that's really been in the public space, not in the scientific space. Scientific space has been experiencing this for a lot longer. Um, so you have these two uh, very different uh, paths in which the practice uh, starts to be founded. And you know you you brought you brought up that data lifecycle management side of things, and that is shown so much that is highlighted so much when the when you're coming in from one direction or the other. The C-suite doesn't necessarily, and it's not their job. This isn't the fault of theirs. It's just it's not their role inside the organization to understand fair data and what it means to, your software development and your research. Uh, that's just not what they do. They they usually presume everybody hears about tagging policies and oh sure our, we have our data, we have our CROs, we have our wet bench. We're getting we're getting dry data from some uh, uh, you know some third party or some public resource. The, the the ownership of that data and the management of that data becomes uh, if you don't have it when the pathway of your of the request for your for your practice to be developed is coming from the business side that is highlighted so much more when you go for it on when you look at it from the other side uh from coming from the scientific implementation you may have some of those tagging policies um quite frankly that's rare for us to see in most organizations however the you you end up with a different uh, implementation issue it's not necessarily you know, what you have and where you're going to get it from and what you could even research when you have the business driving it. But it becomes more of the, once that data flywheel is spinning, 
what are you doing to maintain it? And that is around uh, you know, failed experiments, uh, so irrelevant and relevant data. How are you managing that? Um, and you know, how, how are you uh, able to iterate on, on your data sets as they are uh, becoming more complete? Uh, does that help with the guidance on that? Or you yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I think there's also things are changing in the industry. We have FinOps, we have DevOps, we have you know different things. But at the end of the day, what, what we've learned from startup to multinational biopharma is that if you don't put in uh, some sort of governance that's for employees, scientists, et cetera, to make it part of their objectives, that they're going to view data as an asset and they're going to do everything they can to guard and protect that data from the time, even before it's created uh, and captured, et cetera, you're going to end up with problems. We, we, we've tried to do it in so many different ways, but it's kind of like safety in the laboratory, right? If, if somebody's unsafe, they're a hazard to everyone. If scientists aren't doing the right thing with their data, they're affecting the whole company. And then it becomes a very additive effect. So we've we've uh, uh, we kind of insist on this becomes part of the, your DNA and your as your data is an asset culture, and well, you just, honestly, that's right. what works. Yeah, you, you you're using a really great word there. You know, data is your asset, and you know, data is currency. If you go look at stock market over the last 15 years since social media has been created, you know, what are some of the most successful companies and how do they offer a free product? It's because that data truly is it, it's currency to to their platform. Now, if you take yeah. that as, you know, if you want to look at the longer arc, you know, look, look at a different industry and see where they may have had some struggles, you know, look towards that social media data, data as a data as currency. I could not agree with you more that that's the getting the uh, the entire organization to recognize that full value of each. And, and as I said, you know, irrelevant or relevant data, because sometimes we, we've uh, experienced with customers that we've built in protocols that uh, protect for the reprocessing of data that was previously deemed irrelevant and data that's been deemed relevant. Sometimes you'll go through, you'll, you'll get a new super coder come in, a 10X scientist that can do everything uh, and recognizes a serious flaw in your data processing pipeline, in your pipelines from years past. Now you have to make the decision. Yeah. What's the value of us going, going after that data and seeing what it's getting the, you know, getting the full value out of that asset? Right. How much more can we get out of this? Is it worth reprocessing at all? Well, usually not. It's because it's sometimes, you know, you can be looking at petabyte scale amounts of data. Sometimes it is. If uh, if your pipelines are short and shallow, great. Um, then you run into the problem of how do we identify that data? And we've built in protocols with some folks because they're taking that first principles approach to uh, right. be the rational AI architect here. Uh, you know, what, what should we be doing from the absolute core, core of our practice? And this this organization identified that reprocessing only portions of their data was a critical component to their life cycle. Now, as you know, as you pointed out, uh, you know you have to get everybody to participate in that, and there are rules and regulations you can put into that, and there's there's programmatic methodologies you can put in there. Let the person do the experiment. Don't make them tag it, but you know send them a nag email. Hey, you didn't tag that right. data. Go into the limb system and make sure it's tagged in there. Make sure that data is in there. Uh, but you know. Um, once you get that cultural shift of acceptance that your data is truly currency to your organization and people start to adopt these processes, they develop the next step. Exactly. Is that, you know, uh, that yeah. processing. It's a really Aaron, I think too. Um, so I, where John was saying earlier about FinOps. So a lot of the FinOps strategy is around, you know, building the culture and having individual stakeholders on, say you're, you know, the wet lab team who's using some amount of uh, the cloud or software and the dry lab team or the different stakeholders who are involved at management level. So I guess um, in this whole irrelevant and uh, relevant data scenario, I guess, who are the stakeholders in that cultural strategy? Because you said that uh, it might come from, you know, management, we need to differentiate ourselves, we need an AI platform, but that's coming down on a whole bunch of people in this cultural shift. So I guess, what are each of their roles in your eyes? Um, it's a really, like, it's a massive question to answer because it's, it's, uh, it's everybody. It's, um, it's the leadership team 
educating the and, and ensuring that the entire organization recognizes that their this the data being created is an asset and will help with revenue. Uh, you know, and sometimes that's financially driven. Hey, look, if we if we can get our three petabytes of data tagged, everybody gets the trip to Hawaii or something, you know, whatever it is that they want to come up with for for an incentive plan for that. Um, it's IT, which IT often struggles with in working with the scientific team. That's usually why you know organizations like PTP get involved. We're a good bridge. We we understand what IT is looking to do. We don't want to uh, break away from their processes. You know, Idle has been around for a long time, um, and 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 allows them to deliver service desk and core IT com uh, uh, components to the entire organization, usually back office. But when you start to go towards the science side, it gets a little murky. You know, how do I help manage these buckets? How do I manage these um, access protocols? How do I make sure that we're complying with our, you know, PQ of our GDPR, um, or sorry, our GPU of our <laughs> PQ of our GXP. Sorry, lots of acronyms in there, um, and because they're the people that are responsible for the uh, the logging. So it it is it is unfortunately the entire organization. However, you can identify. And you you need to identify, uh, a, you know something with guardrails around. It. This is where you play. You we're, you're yeah. not going to be held at to fault if you don't comply inside of this uh, this framework here. It, right. As long as if this is your framework, you play this zone. You know, know your role, play your position, that kind of thing. Um, to go and put it as a blanket statement across the entire organization, you're, you're going to fail. And that's the critical role of culture and then strategy. Once you have the culture, the strategy actually gets easier, right? It's, I'm not going to say it's easy. I'm just going to say you can start to really put in a scientific data strategy and people abide by it because the culture is right. So I agree with you. It's, it's everyone. Let's go on to, I wanted to get the culture piece kind of solidified. And, and now I think the key is, People out there are probably asking, what's a rational AI architect? What's your definition of that? What do they do? Yeah. Is this something new? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny when I was sitting in a meeting when I, I dropped this rational AI architect on a few of our other engineers and they're like, that makes sense. Now, what does it mean? And now I, then I had to quickly come up with a, with a definition because it, it was more of a, came to me as more of a, uh, you know, from having 20, 30 years of building things experience, um, going back to first principles just seems right. And, and the rational approach is breaking away from that hype cycle, breaking away from that um, that 10 X engineer that came in from some large bio pharma company and is joining maybe your stealth mode startup that has all these great ideas um, that were previously supported by five, 6,000 IT personnel. And now you're down at a 15 person shop. How do you how do you actually achieve the same scale of goals that you had at that large, you know, publicly traded multinational uh, therapeutics organization? You you won't be able to today. And the rational part comes in about what can we do today that goes back to first principles that says what are the discrete components, you know, in a software development world? You know, what's our MVP? What are you know, how can we actually get the you know the 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 blood flowing in this process to start to see where the life is heading and really always tending every conversation is is this the minimal we can do today to make this happen um, and I know that seems it, 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 that's a struggle for a lot of people to, you know we're, we're in an industry of a lot of overachievers a lot of people have multiple you know multiple PhDs you know decades of education people that really strive to be the best at what they are and saying with personality with personality yeah that's yeah very very fair point um with personality um that they, they uh you know asking them to say what is the least i can do for you to feel like we move the needle and that, that's not the actuality of what you're looking at you look at an eight month time period and you're on it you know let's say you chose agile you chose two week sprints and you know eight months you're looking at 16 significant iterations to your to your pipeline um, you know we're looking at it from that that perspective um, i don't suggest agile all the time but we're going to use that just for easy numbers here with 16 iterations of as least a little minute little, little i can do 
oh, my wife would be ecstatic if I moved the needle 16 times in eight months on house, house projects. Now imagine doing that in your, uh, you know, in your work in 16 iterations in eight months that are not being questioned at month nine. That's really what the, I'm trying to get people to understand with that rational AI ar architect is, you know, what can we do today that we're not going to look back in nine months and say, that was the wrong thing to do. Or as we were talking about the relevant, irrelevant data reprocessing, if we decide that it was wrong, that, you know, month 14 comes along and you're, and you found out that somebody put a uh, wrong percentage on a, on a, you know, uh, on an analytics platform and uh, a bunch of data was tagged as irrelevant. How can we quickly, and quickly is a relative term, how can we um, in a relatively straightforward manner resolve that problem? And I think that's right. what the, AI, right, the rational AI architect is helping trying to instill in the organization. As I, I heard you, as I heard you, go, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I had a question on that too. So is the rational AI architect really about AI or is it more about the things that are leading up to AI? Yeah. Um, what I've found that as we've taken this approach with or, you know, helping companies step into the space here is it ends up becoming a multi, multi, uh, multiple parts of the company end up benefiting. Uh, you know, this is a tough one for me to deal with because we just had a customer that we got pretty far along with a project and determined that, you know, this isn't the right thing for you to do. However, all of the process we put in there, all of the, that because we took that, that rational first principles approach to not, it's not just data that, you know, everybody talks about the data. It's not just about data. It's, it's about, um, you know, software development methodologies, data acquisition uh, policies, um, security, who's working on what. There's a lot to be considered than just data. However, if you do all those other things right, we just said, you know what, we're shifting gears. But the, the LLM model is not going to do it because LLM suck at doing math. Um, but we can quickly, with a context switch of, let's just move over and go back to a, a more traditional bioinformatics platform. And it wasn't a hard shift for us to do. So it's not just about ML. It's about trying to benefit as many areas of your organization. Um, because let's face it, not everything is successful. And right. if, if I can have, uh, if I can leave, and it, let's say it was successful. Now I have two areas, maybe three areas of your organization. Your wet lab psyched because, you know, the QA team came through or QC team came through for your, you know, uh, uh, EMA audit in Germany on your lab. And they said, oh, everything's perfect. Don't worry about it. You guys got nothing to worry about. You pass it with flying colors because you're doing everything you should do. If that can be a consequence of, of an ML implementation, I, I think that's just, that it's, it just, Benefits everybody. Let's right. go. Let's do it. I think there's two things to unpack there. One is versioning, whether it's data versioning, model versioning, whatever. It actually helps keep things pretty clean, especially as you evolve. So you can, and then you can annotate that version and says, hey, we did this in this version, but we realized it wasn't complete or it wasn't up to snuff. We're on to this next version. And like I said, data and the, the modeling environment. And then I think... The, the other thing to unpack is this is research, right? Where if we don't make mistakes, we're still, we're not going to learn. It's just being able to fail faster and quickly regroup and, and solve the problem. And I think, I think that's reality. And I think we're going to see a lot of this too in some of the new approaches. Yeah, absolutely. And you just used two phrasing that uh, really resonated with me. And I failed to mention this at the start, I started this conversation. I am not a scientist. I'm, I'm, I'm a true blue cut from you know, the cloth of IT and technology implementation. Um, mm -hmm. The research aspect is, is often lost on me. I've taken the time to learn the lexicon and be able to do become a translation layer between the scientists and technologists for implementation. Uh, so uh, what I'm, the reason I want to preface that what I'm about to say with that is uh, a lot of what I've experienced over the years are product development from a pure IT space. Uh, and if you go back to 1999 or 2000, when, when Linus uh, Trevald, the uh, initial uh, kernel creator for the operating system, Linux, he also created Git. And the reason he created Git is because there are a lot of people failing fast, as you mentioned, on development of the kernel. And how can we pick what's appropriate? So if you think about uh, software development of an operating system, you have uh, across the world, especially open source, you have tens of thousands of people trying to do the right thing, but not everybody does the right thing. How can we bubble those things up and, um, 
and see them and see them become successful. Now, fast forward to your informatics environment. Now, today, you're let's say you have uh, an NF core, or you have a, a NextFlow pipeline that you're working on, or um, you know Airflow, whichever platform you're looking to use. Um, uh, you know, you, you how can you identify that? What tools are they using? They're using those same processes. They're using Git. You're using uh, code build tools. You're using pipelining. These are all mm -hmm. software. These are uh, methodologies that have happened through software development for decades and uh, just now, now right. really, really becoming prevalent in the bioinformatics yeah. space and the MS space. Actually have a lot of clients uh, in general where, as you're d discussing versioning and um, you know how this affects different companies, I think even when you look at AI itself, the clients we work with, they might be uh, need to adjust their bioinformatics pipeline and they want to rerun that data through the pipeline, but right. the same things that happen early on in the organization that might not have been fixed, they move on to AI and suddenly now it's, uh, you know, a much heavier concern to the company because it's a lot more expensive to keep versioning that data and, and adjusting those models. So I think that's, we see that a lot too at PTP. Yep. Well, at the end of the day, I think, you know, we're trying to drive, th this is all about efficiency gains, right? This isn't about magic bullets, you know, and unfortunately you brought up the hype before mm -hmm. people push this hype down from the top down. It causes problems. It causes a lot of churn. But at the end of the day, when you're in environments where scientists are anywhere between 40 and 80 percent, and, and when I say 80 percent, that is real uh, data wrangling, like very difficult to get work done. They're constantly munging data, constantly trying to get it. But you, and you you start to build these environments where you reduce that. That's what we're trying to achieve here. You're trying to achieve not only fair data, but fair processes, fair automation. You go down the line, right? You want it to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And a lot of times we get pigeonholed in like even digital transformation people. This is why 84% of digital transformation has failed to date because people put blinders on and they think it's all about digitizing data or this or that but what it, it, the problem is it's pervasive it goes across everything it's up down sideways and it's a true transformation it's not just the digital piece and i think you guys have gotten sucked into this a lot where you're seeing oh my gosh this is much more than just an ai project so yeah Aaron, what about um the client that we work with who they were saying, hey, we really want to uh, you know, build an AI machine learning model on top of our data, but we had to pull it all back and, and talk about that data orchestration component first, getting those databases uh, in a working order. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, yeah, you know, part that that A and, and FAIR, the accessibility side really shines through, especially in the ML space. You know, you're um, you know, we're talking about massive data sets here that need to be processed. Uh, you know, the and, and you know you're looking at 22,000 tokens per megabyte. So that's 22,000 essentially vectors inside of your database. That gets really big really fast. Um, and so you know you're talking about terabytes and terabytes of data. It's a lot of uh, evaluation that needs to be performed on that data and reconstructed. So if you if you're not storing your data appropriately in the front end, and that could be you know several different you know blob storage or you know as some SQL based back or vector based. If you're not making those decisions um, before you even go to load it, it can get really tough for you and expensive. Yeah. And very expensive. You know, that, exactly. That, that, the 22,000 tokens, you're like, oh, 22,000 tokens, that's a lot per megabyte. Per megabyte. Yep. <laughs> like, so right, I'll, I'll just say this and then we'll move on to the next thing. You brought up yeah. expensive. We fortunately have done the uh, market research on what life sciences are paying for cloud computing and all that, your eyes would fall out of your head if you saw some of these numbers that, and not just because of the, the the tens of millions or even hundreds of millions, but the amount of waste that goes on in there because of unoptimized environments and stuff like that. So, so that's another conversation at another day. Um, in the life sciences industry, what are your key takeaways as a rational AI architect? Like what what, what what are some of the things you're seeing or have experienced? Yeah, um, as 
part of the hype cycle that we've all been experiencing, we hear about Claude 3 being released on AWS. So Am you know, Anthropic now allows, can now is now licensed inside of Amazon. You've got um, you know, Chat GPT getting better and better. You've got Facebook, you know, Meta out there with Llama. You hear a lot about these uh, foundational models that are ready to run. Um, and the 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 and, and oh, you can easily import data. Okay, great. I've I've based uh, the foundational model on the internet, and now it knows how to read my data. So if the internet knows what my data is, great. But there's an institutional knowledge aspect of it that often goes forgotten as the development happens. Uh, and that's you training on top of that foundational model, or you having to make a decision of, we're going to go with our own foundational model, which is a, you know, mon a massive monolithic task uh, to go from Greenfield. You know, massive amounts of data, lots of you know smart people creating the relationships between that data and and helping train those models. So foundational models in the LLM space are um, are, are just extremely difficult to settle in on for the implementation today. So you see you see um, you know I I had to I used um, open uh, uh, ChatGPT the other day. I uploaded a, an Excel sheet of my daughter's softball games for this year and said, make an uh, iCal event for this. And it did it, great. Because it has all that knowledge out there from documentation about what iCal means. But if I take a FastQ file and upload it today and say, you know, tell me something about this, it, 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 the likelihood it's going to have anything is, is, is lost. Right. Because the foundational model that you're based off of isn't there. So there are great foundational models out there that can get you started. There's still a significant amount of scientific training that's going to have to go on any one of those models, and how you can do that is based on the platforms that you're going to be based on. You're going to be using, and Bedrock's getting better at that. But you know, every platform, no matter the software, there's always a limitation. So that's that's a if you're looking for one thing to really focus in on on AIML specific, and again going back to that rational first principles approach, which foundational model are we going to do? Are we are we using an off the shelf one that we're going to train? Are we going to train our own? How are we going to be doing that? That's right. And I guess yeah. security is a big a big deal because mm -hmm. you know you don't want to be feeding someone's external model with your data. That's what that's what petrifies uh, IT and other folks in in, in companies. Um, do, how do you compare the cloud adoption to AI adoption? So this is in your hands a little more than the cloud was when it first you know really started to take off, you know, 12, 15 years ago, but if you if you're old enough like me to remember, um, you know there was the big stiff arm from legal, from finance, from yeah. you will not we will never use the cloud. Don't you know being threatened if we bring up the cloud again in this meeting, John, we're going to have to ask you to leave type of thing. You yeah. know that's that's real. Like yeah. so, but this is a little this is a more in your hands self productivity tool that I I feel has the ability to adopt faster, but what are your thoughts? So uh, Amazon has a great saying that I use when it, when faced with this, um, and, and it might not have even been Amazon, but they're the ones who taught me it. So I'll give, I'll, give a, I'll give them credit for it. But it's that undifferentiated heavy lifting. When you can explain to an organization that there is a heavy lift associated with a, you know, a, a commodity IT delivery. So that's your, yeah, your virtualization, your, your storage, all of those things. That takes a lot of time and people to go in and help deliver. So if you add up all the salaries and all the costs of owning that hardware, amortization, everything along those lines, there used to be a, 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 not just the security side, but there was also the fight of cloud's going to cost more. That was usually what I heard about. Cloud's going to cost more. Uh, well, yeah, if you, but I don't have to have somebody maintaining my SQL server anymore and updating it, patching it, and making sure that my security person, who I still need a security person, is going to be able to validate that that environment's secure and safe. Yeah, that from a financial perspective, if you can get the the company's head around on un, un, uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting, that usually helps sell it. But from a security perspective, um, and certainly you know, Amazon has Glove, Glove Cloud now. Microsoft has their own solutions for those things. Um, yeah, I, I I'm old enough to remember when VLAN hopping was a thing back in the early 2000s. People tried to convince everybody, oh, you can send a bad packet down a Cisco switch and jump into a different network, magically switch over. I mean, that was a, it was a farce of implementation then and lab only approach, but those things still stick. People still think that um, that you know that that, uh, 
that that's possible inside of the 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 um the cloud space every breach every major breach I might even be able to say every breach I don't like using the word every but the great majority of breaches um are are usually user implementation problems they're not the cloud fault and that goes for mm -hmm. all the providers that's oracle google you know uh, whoever amazon um uh, doesn't matter the the flaws come from your implementation so if you combine those two things and say let's take that undifferentiated heavy lifting of us not having to update our active directory server or patch our windows machine or make sure that our network has uh, a firewall on it take that money slide it over to qualified experts that can make sure that your implementation on top of that cloud platform is successful. That's 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 the, the struggle we see, and that's what we have to help sell on is uh, to, to, uh, to get somebody to move over to the cloud. That's that, I'd rather have one or two really great people managing very precise parts of my environment because they're focused on it. They're going to do it well. Yeah. So just like you were you're, you're talking about your data wrangling a moment ago, same scenario. Do you want your do you want your network your security engineer worried about a cable in a closet someplace because somebody's desk phone isn't working? Or do you want to have them worried about your security implementation? Do you want your scientist sitting in a console with grep and awk and trying to get some python library to do some data parsing? Because it because they don't even know what the data meant, or do you want to have right. a good tagging policy that they just ask that data store, give me everything with this tag on it? Yeah, I think on that it? too. Uh, as far as it goes, when companies are actually adopting AI and machine learning practices, I think a lot of times, as uh, we were discussing earlier, it depends on who that request comes from, mm -hmm. and if you know leadership says, "Hey, this is where we want to be." The issue is that even if it's not today, the world's you know moving towards AI and machine learning, but you can do things to prepare to be there. So whether it's those security components that we're discussing, or it's uh, you know that data cleaning process and the versioning, right? You can right. start putting it into place because I think uh, Eric can elaborate a little more. But somebody was using multiple different models, right? That were pre-trained, and they were coming to us saying, "Oh, well, are the models broken?" And it, at that point, you're putting on the magnifying glass, like, hey, we're now we're in forensics. Let's see what it all looks like first. But I think uh, Aaron will be able to elaborate a little more on that. Um, the, you have to give me a little more reminder on that one here. I'm sorry. Oh, they were using uh, Rosetta and Meta and those different models. And they said, hey, we have these all together. But for some reason, their results weren't as intelligent oh, as they yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah, it goes, yeah, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with that, you know, that that foundational model choice there, um, you know, and just knowing that um, there's additional training that needs to go around it. There, they needed to find it, it's, it's a lot of these models too. Uh, there's the, uh, it's like I, I swear it's like right out of Douglas Adams, like the probability probability estimator. <laughs> um, it's you know a little gr a bar that. Uh, they literally will render it and render it in uh, some of these tools as a bar of 100% of probability that the that the rendering happened appropriately. And I don't think people understand that those those tools exist for you to understand. Uh, John, you you used a word that I don't like. I like confabulate. I won't use the other one. I promised on LinkedIn I wouldn't use the the H word. Um, the uh, but if you want to if you want to predict the confabulation and understand that there's a, a probability that that confabulation was at 98%. Sometimes these tools, you know, during implementation, oh, I just tried all the models and they are all wrong. Yeah, but one might be more wrong and one might be less wrong. Let's go to the less wrong one and then let's do some prompt engineering. Let's do some additional training on top of that model. Right. And you can you can start to drive towards success and get that probability probability up higher. Before Anna, we get into next, uh, another question, I just want to say one thing just based on my personal experience. Senior scientists used to come to me and say, we've got nothing. Could you build or run this model and give us an answer? And you have to be very careful, you know, with that response. But the point I'm trying to make is, I don't think people realize that you may not have the data, you may not have the experimentation, but you're, you're being asked to make a serious decision in the organization. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a, again, a great value is if you can, collate and pull 
internal X data, your your models are, you know, validated and things are working and looking okay. It's all they have. You're you're giving them a direction, right? You can go to the left, you can go to the right, or you can, you know, turn your car off. Cause that's really where sometimes these project and programs go, um, where scientists need answers to move forward. And so that that's like a real thing. And I, I'm not quite sure how, you know, if everybody understands that sometimes in the drug discovery world. Yeah, certainly the, um, you know, the, you don't know what you, you don't know what you have until you really look. Um, yeah. That's the, and, and just, just a request of it doesn't, doesn't warrant immediate answer. Right. Uh, let, there are, we need to go back and figure out what it is that we're capable of. What's the right model? What do, does the data exist? Do we need to do additional uh, management around that data that we have? Uh, you know, a lot, well, a, yeah. there's a lot to consider. It's it's not an insurmountable amount, and um, and you know, there, there's two stressors that I see that happen from that kind of request. It's it seems insurmountable because there's it's so new, new, uh, it's and complex, uh, and what does it mean for me? And you know, that's I understand, and, and thankfully in the in the drug discovery space, there are quite often folks that understand that. Um, more often than not, more often than not, folks understand that if I if I can get to a target faster, I get to a cure faster, I get to a treatment faster, and that's really what has driven a you know, great number yep. of the folks in this industry. Um, so those you know, but that also means that you know, if I put an ML in there and I put an AI in there, and I allow anybody in the organization to participate with an LLM that is creating training that I then take out and put into my ML models. That's, you know, going off and doing deeper research. I shrink our company account. I shrink my value. And I disagree with that, that wholeheartedly. I think it focuses uh, people on a tighter target and then so everybody else can go on to another target because these things are so different. The yeah, great. models are vastly, vastly different. And I'm talking coming off the same machines, some NGS machines, same you can put the same sample in, get the same data out, but if yeah. you're going after two different targets, everything training that model will be different. Not maybe not everything, but it's a, a huge amount of data uh, of uh, of of the model will be different to to get to what those people want. I think it just yeah. it. I think ML opens up more opportunity. And Ag you've... agreed. We this this type of thinking has been has probably gone on forever. Mm -hmm. I used to have computational chemists tell me this new program or this new tool new tool is going to put them out of business and they're going to get sacked they're going to get laid off and i'm just like how can you even think that way there's so many difficult problems out there you're just not going to be doing the mundane ones anymore you're going to be actually working on really difficult problems so yes. yeah it's kind of crazy you're not trying to figure out how to get, you know, some duck DB working with Python so that you can do some quick translations inside of your, your laptop before you, you know, send it off to your, your, your yeah. Python. It's, uh, uh, yeah, that, I, I could not agree more. It's, it goes back to the, you know, learn to code, you know, mm -hmm. learn to code. Well, yeah. guess what? It's, it, it didn't happen really that way. Where, where <laughs> are the requests coming in? So I was going to go ahead, Scott. Well, I, I was going to say, even with uh, well, the valley of death in drug discovery and development, a lot of there's no right now um, from like like lead identification or target discovery all the way through clinical trials. There's no models that can do that. But where people are having a lot of success is that sort of, you know, lead identification or, you know, which molecules or which proteins are going to be the most beneficial to our company to start examining further. And I think as uh, Aaron's saying as well, right with your foundational model selection, I think a lot of people right now, it's just at, in discussing the hype train, right? They're saying, oh, we need generative AI. We need these big LMs. We need yeah. like, you know, but not everybody's looking and saying we're mapping, you know, like single cell and two dimensional data and molecular characteristics and latent space. And we're doing this crazy model you can really, with that foundational model, start small and at least start learning from your data and then putting those practices in place. So it is good data. Because I think as, uh, you know, Aaron can test to as well, once your data is good, and, uh, you know, fair data, right? You can really do anything with it. And I think that's where people are, are jumping the gun in the hype train right now. Yeah. Where do you think, where are the requests for AI and ML and generative AI, LLM 
development coming from? Like, and if it's coming from the top down, do you, is that more inherent with problems? If it's coming from the, the chemist or the molecular biologist or the data scientist, is that gonna, you know, w which one might potentially come with more problems? I think it's it, it, it's an unfortunate answer. It's both have their own inherent problems. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's with the, um, if it's the bottom, bottom, if individual contributor up towards leadership, um, usually that is around the capabilities of the entire organization, uh, as we were discussing earlier with, you know, getting the everybody in on this idea of we have to, uh, maintain our platform in a certain manner so that this whole thing can be successful. That's where the struggle comes from. If it's the uh, leadership down, um, certainly you're, that's where you're going to have more of the, uh, the capabilities problem. Not so much that, you know, people you top down usually can, you know, force culture uh, and force people to, to adhere to the, the designs of that platform. However, do you have the people around to actually go and deliver on the components that you're asking them to deliver? That's, that's usually the, the struggles there. Um, the one that scares me the most personally uh, is the top down. It's um, because it's, it often can be perceived as a failure of, of, of a platform too early. Uh, right. and going back to, going back to, you know, uh, software development life cycle. Uh, you know, I said earlier that I'm not a big fan of, of agile in this, um, in this, uh, in this development pipeline, something like Kanban, something that's a little bit quicker and a little more iterative and gets, it has more showing quicker is a better method. Um, so if the, you know, the delivery of the platform can take some time. And especially if you're trying to find appropriate resources to help build out a component, um, that can be a harder thing for leadership to understand uh, because there's not in it every day. They're in, they're in a different part of the business. Just like I wouldn't understand the accounting side of it to the level or the legal side of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Every, it's a, I think it, that's a harder thing to translate. You know, as we, um, let's face it, we all, there's a great author, uh, an MIT professor. I think he's ran the media lab for a while and maybe still does. Um, David Rose, he had a book from, Two decades ago called enchanted objects and he's got a great great view on the perception of technologies so much has become zero cognitive events that you look at your alexa it tells you what shift you look at a clock you know what time it is there it just becomes uh natural for you to perceive information from these technology platforms and they seem easy now i i um the Olympics were on, we're driving down the highway and my, my daughter complained that she was getting jitter on her stream. I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that the live video stream of skiing from Russia on the other side of the world is jittering as we're doing 65 miles an hour down the highway. <laughs> you know, uh, it, you don't necessarily understand the, the deep complexities of technology and it's become culturally perceived as easy. This stuff should be easy. Uh, because it, when they, by the time they're interacting with a very long developed product, it has become easy. Um, and I think that that's, right. that's what terrifies me is having to make that explanation of this software's hard. Software's hard. Do you think um, from an AI machine learning perspective, like to offset maybe some of these issues or maybe even potential false starts like an AI center of excellence or mm -hmm. some sort of steering committee? could be put in place and it might actually be a, a better approach? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, the AI center of excellence you know, goes along with what all the cloud providers really started to push, you know, five, 10 years ago, uh, the cloud center of excellence. I think you need to do that again. And a lot of the principles, are, the groundwork is already laid there. I, uh, the ITIL standards, you know, about managing your infrastructure and your people and your processes existed years ago. You know, Part 11 existed years ago. Um, you know, there's frameworks that have been slowly getting built upon. And I think the next one that people really need to start considering is getting that AI center of excellence in early so that you can go to a group of um, maybe not experts, but at least the most knowledgeable in the organization to help find the experts to drive the right choices. And again, I know we've been chasing after this foundational model choice a lot during this conversation, but it is so critical. 
And if that customer that Scott mentioned earlier had an AI center of excellence and said, all right, why are we trying all four models? Is that financially responsible? Because that's going to cost you money to go try the same thing four times. Um, you know, is there some way that we can get uh, determine, you know, get data driven uh, results out of that to determine what is the best one? Getting going after that probability probability meter, um, it, those types of things. Having uh, a group of people identify that again, go after that first principles approach in in your AI implementation and using all these other existing frameworks to help create their um, create their structure is is invaluable. It's going to drive down your costs. It's going to drive down your implementation time. It's going to you know, allow whichever direction your right. practice has been come has been pushed into the organization to have the people that can take the time to explain upwards that you know technology doesn't just always work that way and also uh you know maybe push back on some people that are trying to accelerate past the the, the company's capabilities yeah i hope folks are listening to this because this is critical i you know i worked in large pharma and i've seen this push down effect of hurry up and get it done, but it hurry up and it usually fails. They spend millions of dollars. I told you the numbers out there are 84, 85% digital transformation failures. And it's all because um, people think it's going to be easy. Brilliant people, um, unfortunately, uh, go along for the ride thinking, Oh yeah, you know, uh, science isn't complex. We can do this, we can do that, and it it it's just underestimated every time. And I've seen it my whole career. I've seen the magic bullets, of uh, of uh, you know, but it ultimate it's the ultimate team sport in drug discovery, and it takes a lot of smart people working together to solve, uh, discover, and 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 you know, create a, a better quality of life for people. And uh, and again, hoodwinked. You know, the marketing, the hype yeah. just creates lots and lots of problems. Um, so I hope people are listening to say, slow down, get, you know, clean up your data. Uh, let's get, let's do this in a very stepwise fashion. Let's make sure we have the right culture to even approach this program, right? This initiative, this program, um, because otherwise you're going to spend tens of millions of dollars and you're going to fail. And when you don't have to, you don't have to fail if you do it, you know, do it right the first time. Well, even with querying data, I think you need to have the ontologies in place to be able to interrogate the data, right? But right. when you're using AI machine learning, you're doing that on steroids now, right? So I think that the practices up to there are all related in that whole data, data flywheel. Uh, so slow, if down, you, slow down to go fast, right? Yep, exactly. So in in your opinions, what is some of the first things that need to be done from an AI ML vision? I, I use the word vision, yeah. not because I'm a visioneer, but just the <laughs> vision perspective and making it uh, a success. Uh, identify the problem as tightly as you possibly can for your ML, your AI ML practice. Uh, don't just come in and say, we need to figure out, like if you just start building off of, we need to find something in our organization to be successful at, that's the first time you're gonna say, slow down to go fast. Like we leadership or brilliant 10X informatician that's down there, what is it that you really truly want to solve? And what, what are we going to target that is that minimal viable product, that MVP? that we can start yeah. to build off of. And until that has clarity around it, don't spend money. Don't, don't, you can have, you can have these conversations and the conversations can be costly too, I understand. But don't go off and say, you know, we need to go out and buy as many NVIDIA and uh, H100 uh, or H1000 uh, GPUs and get a server and, and, and drop millions of dollars on this infrastructure. <clears throat> no, find the real problem. And you can iterate on some of these problems really quickly. So, and I said, you know, I'm saying not spend money and say not, don't, don't make a large capital investment in this. Mm -hmm. um, you can build on this Mac in front of me has the power for me to go put Olama on, load an LLM, train some data and start to get some results off. Of it. Does that work? Great. You can start really small and, and get to that MVP. This is the problem. Right. <clears throat> tight, tight product requirements as much as possible because that, as you mentioned earlier, there's so many people coming in from all outside. It's not just a hype, a, a social hype cycle. 
it is a product type cycle too. It is, there yep. are so many things out there that say, I can do it. I can do it better. I can do it better. I can do it better. So it, you really need to know what you're trying to solve more so than okay. I think before, because it's, it's hard to shift if you do it wrong. Right. It's very costly. To shift. One of the things I learned too, is like um, the data assessment side of it. So mm -hmm. just knowing what you got, like, you, you know, we, we've come, we, we come with numbers, right? So 80% of the data is just not, but in many instances, not even worth going forward with. But what we learned is if it's done internally, they created that mess, unfortunately. And then they try to assess their own data and they, they just get in this big, you know, eddy vortex of trying to figure out how to make it work. But an external view on somebody's data environment, we get to ask the tough questions and we really can help. You guys can really help them vet through that. I think on, you know, data that is, uh, has confidence, data that you trust, data that you need to get rid of. Um, and I think that is actually one of the first steps in, and then developing the culture and the scientific data strategy and stuff, just assessing what you have, even assessing the health of the company. Can you even take this project on and be successful? Um, we have we have done that and and we realized that hey you know if you had just asked the question how what's the success rate of your projects over the past couple of years oh well we'd rather not talk about that right so then why do it again let somebody help you you know sometimes big uh, be the person in the room that says no or says we don't advise you do that type of thing so i think um i th i think there's a lot of work to be done out there but I do think there is a cadence on, hey, the the fuel, the currency for all of this is that data, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to all of it. But you know, don't don't get in your airplane with with water and your gas, right? It's a it's a dangerous proposition. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, believe it or not, we're at the top of the hour. <laughs> it always goes that. super fast. <laughs> Was is there anything you guys want to say uh, before we're, we're, we go? Is there any like lasting, uh, you know, parting comments or anything? Scott, you have anything? Yeah, I think um, just from my perspective, I think I hear all these like stories of GSK has its own divisions producing data purely to train their AI and machine learning models. And I think everybody knows the industry is going that direction. And I think, Right now, people spend so much money on ELNs and different th tools that can help add scientific context, all that. So you don't have to start it today, but you could at least start cleaning up what exists. And I think there's so many memes out there of like, you know, the whole boat on top of a like like a pin needle. And they're saying mm -hmm. this is your tech stack right now. And I think it, it's going to be so serious, especially if you're a company who wants to keep iterating on the data. So just start somewhere and you don't have to start big is I think what I would uh, throw in there. Yeah. And I, I'll echo that and say, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the as sim something as simple as your, your, your Mac in front of you can start to have you iterate on some of those, those uh, solutions. They're not going to be the complete solution for sure, but you'll start to find the boundaries. Uh, and, and if at all possible that AI center of excellence or uh, some leader, uh, a person in your leadership of your organization helping to get on board with not the today implementation of the culture shift and technology shift that has to happen to be successful, but somebody inside your organization that says, I will help drive this forward at, at a leadership level because we see how important it is. So long as they understand it's, it has to be iterative. It has to be right. awful slow. Uh, find somebody like that inside your organization to help drive those things demonstrate through small iterative testing uh, don't presume that this is going to be uh you know uh, as something as simple as asking chat gpt to write you a song it's not it's yeah it's a lot more complex than that yeah and and i will say there's hype in the industry for the marketing type hype but there's also hype from the players out there that said though we achieved this we did that a lot of it isn't is, is high i won't say it's not true there are some people doing really great things but I will say as a whole, there's hype on what people have achieved or as a company or this or that. Don't get nervous about that as an organization. Listen to what Scott and Aaron are saying. Start small. 
that's a distraction. Just start sooner than later. Don't wait 12 years to get on the cloud. Don't wait 10 years to start engaging in AI and machine learning. All right, cool. Thanks, Thank guys. You, it's been really good. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. All right, take care. Hi, everyone. Thank you.